question about you. We'd love to get you know, to know you a little better. Uh, and we invite you to come back anytime that you can. We'd love to sit down and study with you and show you that the Central Church of Christ is a place that you need to be, that the Church of Christ is, is the one true church. And we'd love to have the opportunity to sit down and study God's Word with you and, and show you that. We do meet at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings for Bible class hour, 10 o'clock for our worship assembly, and then we have a 5 o'clock service on Sunday evenings. We have a 10 o'clock Wednesday morning Bible class, and then we meet at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings as well. And we'd love to have you for any of those services. Don't forget to pick up a bulletin and go through the names there that are uh, dealing with difficulties that are on our prayer list. Reach out to them, make contact, minister to them in any way that you can, but especially keep them in your prayers. We also want to remind everyone that uh, on July 2nd, we're going to have a Vacation Bible School planning meeting. That'll be after services that Sunday evening. Our VBS is tentatively scheduled for August 12th, so mark your calendars, make your plans, and bring your ideas. I'm expecting big things of you guys after now that I've seen some pictures of what y'all have done in the past. VBS ought to be great. So we're looking forward to that. Also, July 1st, the Saturday before that VBS meeting, we're having a, a, a barbecue supper here at the church building. And the men are going to be cooking, and we're looking forward to that. So mark your calendars for that as well. I want to th say thanks to everyone who came out to Game Light last night. Our family game night was a, a big success. It always is a great way to fellowship and encourage one another. That is usually the first Second Saturday of each month, so you can uh, set your calendars to that as well. With those thoughts in mind, we're going to begin this morning. I just want to give you, I want to let you know what we're going to be doing. This morning, we're going to have a, a service that centers around and focuses on the Lord's Supper. It's my plan, I've talked about this with the elders, and they've given me their support of this, but it's my plan to do a service that centers around each item of worship. That didn't go. There we go. We're going to begin with the Lord's Supper. We're going to do an entire service that centers around each act of worship. The Lord's Supper. Giving, singing, praying, preaching. And, and each one of those services is going to be a little different order. But it's because I think we need to put equal emphasis on each item. Sometimes when we come to worship, our minds are distracted and we tend to think more. One item of worship is more important than all the others. Everything that we do in worship is to please God. And so we need to understand that each act is equally important to Him. We can please Him in all five of those acts. So let's take a, a service to put an emphasis on each one of those acts, and then we'll come together and hopefully have a, a renewed perspective on our worship assembly as a whole. So we're going to begin this morning. We'll look at a lot of scriptures, and then we'll say a few words about those scriptures. And then James is going to lead us in a song that pertains to those, to those ideas, and then we will partake. So at this point, I just want to ask everyone, do you have the emblems? Does everybody have the fruit of the vine, and the bread. If, if not, raise your hand and we can get that to you right now. We do need one. A couple up here. Miss Susie needs one. Dave's coming around with him. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's turn our Bibles first then to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verses 17 through 22. Our first song this morning is going to be, Lead Me to Calvary. Everything that we do in worship, every interaction that we have with people in our daily lives, every decision that we make, everything that happens to us should lead us to Calvary, especially the partaking of the Lord's Supper. 
we remember the Lord's death, His sacrifice for us every first day of the week. It doesn't become common. It doesn't lose its meaning because we do it every Sunday. Calvary is the centerpiece of all of human history. God was from the beginning of time leading up to the sacrifice of His only begotten Son. And ever since, we have looked back on the cross of Calvary in remembrance of what He did for us. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 17. And they clothed Him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about His head and began to salute Him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote Him on the head with a reed and did spit upon Him. And bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. We want to be led to Calvary. We want everything that we experience in life to remind us that we have a Savior. A Savior who did something that we could never do for ourselves. Who because He was sinless could become the sacrifice that would take away the sin of the world. We want to be led to Calvary to remember that we have a God who loves us. Who has plans for us. And who has prepared heaven for us. As we sing this song, let our minds go back to that hill those three crosses, and our suffering Savior whose body was bloodied and beaten, who was mocked, who was ridiculed, who wore a crown of thorns. Let us picture that as we are led to Calvary. King of my life.
Every failure in life and every success should lead us back to Calvary. We're going to look next at Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 54. Then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man also was with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour... After, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What we're reminded of here is that none of us are perfect. Under pressure, we may do or say things that we didn't think we were capable of. Peter had made boastful claims about willing to die for Jesus. Even if every every one of the other apostles forsook him, even if they all denied him, Peter said, I will never deny you. But what Jesus revealed to Peter is that he is only a man. That sometimes we fail to live up to what we say we're going to do. We all make mistakes, we all fall, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But what we're reminded of when we read about Peter's denial is that Jesus never gives up on any of us. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter whether we have denied him. It doesn't matter whether we're the ones who spit in his face, drove the crown of thorns into his skull. Jesus still loves us. Our next song is, If That Isn't Love. Calvary is the fullest and truest expression of love that the world will ever know. God, our creator, humbled himself. Jesus became a man. The one whom he created, he allowed himself to be born, to be a child, to struggle, to know everything that it is to be human. And he did it because he loved us. He lived without sin. He's God. He cannot sin. He can't be tempted to sin. But Jesus as a man was tempted. But he resisted. He lived sinlessly. And he offered himself for us. Our creator, our God died for us. If that isn't love, then nothing is. We're also going to read Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood there beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The same people who were saying these things, who were responsible for his crucifixion, the same people who had resisted him and opposed him every step throughout his ministry when he would 
do good, when he would perform a miracle, when he would teach truth, they denied it. These are the same people to whom Jesus said to the Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't understand who I am. They don't understand the sacrifice that I'm making. They don't understand your will, your plan for them. Father, forgive them. Even with my sacrifice, the ones who are responsible for my death. Jesus, Peter denied Jesus, and Jesus still loved him. These Jews crucified him, and Jesus still wanted forgiveness for them. If that isn't love, then there is no such thing as love. He loves the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the only hill of Galilee, there to lay down his life for me. that Jesus showed in going to the cross is perfect love. It's a love that isn't afraid. It's a love that isn't ashamed. But it's a love that sacrifices. It's a love that gives itself for friends, for neighbors, for family, and for enemies. And it's the kind of love that we should have for everyone around us as well. When we look at the cross, what we see is an emblem of suffering. When we look at the cross, we see what was to the Jews a curse. God himself said that cursed is anyone who hangeth upon a tree. And that is the idea of crucifixion. It applied to Jesus, but Jesus changed that curse. And going to the cross and demonstrating perfect, selfless love. Jesus was lifted up from the earth. And he knew that it was only by being lifted up from the earth 
that the Father would be glorified, that His will would be done, that salvation could be offered to all mankind. He changed that curse, and He changed the curse of death for us as well. For Christians, because of Jesus' death on the cross, we don't have to fear death because we know that there's going to be a better life on the other side. We may fear the unknown, the unknown aspects of death, how we're going to die, when we're going to die, but we don't have to fear being dead because we know that Jesus came forth from the grave. We are as well, but Jesus had to be lifted up on that cross. Jesus is our mediator. He is both God and man. He can hold the hand of God and represent mankind to God the Father. And He can hold the hand of mankind and represent God to humanity. He could only do so by being lifted up on that cross. Jesus speaks several times about being lifted up. In John 3 verses 14 and 15, He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. In John 8 verse 28, Jesus says, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And then in John 12, verse 32, Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus was lifted up from the earth. He changed the curse. He gave hope to humanity. Because He is God in the flesh. He is the Son of God. In John chapter 19... We read of Jesus before Pilate, beginning in verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Pilate was convinced that Jesus was their king. I believe that Pilate thought, As their king, this humble man, this carpenter, this one in whom I have found no guile, we can coexist. I can be the Roman governor, And he can be their king. He's worthy of it. Why won't they just accept him? Pilate would eventually wash his hands of the whole situation, trying to remove himself from any guilt. But I believe that Pilate was convinced Jesus truly was their king. And imagine then his unbelief that Jesus' own people, who hated Rome so much... And yet still they would reject and crucify their own king. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate says to them. The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and the two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. When we survey that wondrous cross, we see the love of God perfected towards humanity. It's an emblem that once carried shame, but now it is that picture of perfect love. It is the image that to us reminds us, not just every first day of the week, but every day of our lives, that we have salvation through Jesus Christ. Our next song is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. One more, Matthew chapter 27, forgot about this one, verses 50 through 54. This is what even Romans 
said when they surveyed that wondrous cross. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. For a Roman centurion to survey the wondrous cross, to see that man hanging in shame, to know that he is the king of the Jews who willingly gave himself, it caused him to make this confession. Truly this was the Son of God. Let us, when we survey the wondrous cross, be filled with that perfect love and knowledge that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. righteous and heavenly Father we thank thee Lord for thy son who was so willing to go to the cross and die for us every one of us that we do not deserve his love 
for the sins that we commit against him. We are thankful for thy forgiveness, for thy grace, and for thy love. Father, we thank you for being with us each and every day that we can sing praises, pray to you, and we thank you for all that you do for each and every one of us. Father, please remember those that are ailing today that can't be with us, those that are here and not doing well. Be with those, Lord, that have lost loved ones recently, Lord. Comfort them as only you can. Father, be with our elders and Brother David as he brings us the word today, such beautiful words, such loving words. Father, we just thank you for them. Be with our first responders, Lord, that watch over us as we sleep. And through the day also, we pray, Lord, for the doctors and the nurses that tend to those that, that need their services, Lord. And that you bless them and that they take care of us and provide us with what we need through your hands. Father, we just thank you for this day that we can be in this house of worship to hear thy words, to experience thy love. Be with us as we go through this service. It's in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. After we consider these passages and sing a song, we will partake of the bread. In John chapter 19, we read about what Jesus endured for us. Life is difficult. Life is full of pain and sorrow. And sometimes our bodies can be racked with excruciating pain. It's difficult for us to have a desire to go on. What we read here is that Jesus endured not only the cross, but before he went to the cross. And it's hard for us to imagine having our arms, our wrists, and our feet pierced with railroad spikes. Of hanging there. It's hard for us to imagine our lungs filling up with our own body fluids until... Death by crucifixion occurred by drowning, not because of the pain or the blood loss. It's hard, to us, it's hard for us to imagine what Jesus endured on the cross, but before he ever went there, he was scourged. History tells us that as many, if not more, people died from the scourging before they ever went to the cross than did from the crucifixion. Scourging is when they would take the accused and tie him to a post, tie his hands to a post, and extend his back muscles out as far as they could. The soldier had a whip of cords, and in the end of those leather strips were pieces of bone and metal and hard things and they would strike him across the back that metal 
and that bone would grip into his flesh and the soldier would then rip his back open. When we partake of the unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper, we are to remember the suffering and the anguish that Jesus endured in His flesh, in His body. The bread represents the physical side of Jesus. As a man, He experienced everything that we do. He knows what pain is. He knows what sorrow is. He knows what suffering is. And He willingly endured it for us. John 19, verses 1 through 3 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged Him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on His head. And they put on Him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote Him with their hands. The thorns were not just little briars that scratch us on our legs when we walk through a wee, a field. They were long projectiles, hard enough to pierce the skin, driven down into his scalp when they hit him on the head with a reed. They smote him with their hands. They spat upon him. And Jesus willingly accepted this. Because he loves us, because there was no other way, because He was submissive to the Father's will. Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. Here, Isaiah, the Messianic prophet, depicts Jesus as the suffering servant. We're reminded that Jesus suffered physically. That part of his sacrifice was giving his body for us. But the unleavened bread represents his sinless nature. He did not sin. Even in spite of mockery, cruelty, ridicule, pain, scourging, crucifixion, he still loved. He still desired forgiveness. And we're reminded of that when we read Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 7. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. The song we're going to sing is, I gave my life for thee. And after we sing this song, we'll say a prayer and we'll partake of that unleavened bread. Let us remember the anguish and the pain that Jesus felt in His person, in His body, in His flesh, all for us. I gave my life.
us pray. Father, we remember that Jesus gave his life for us, that his body was broken, that he endured pain and suffering that none of us can imagine. And we remember, Father, that he did so because he loves us, because he knew that only through his sacrifice, his suffering, could he nail our sins to his cross. As we partake of this bread, which represents his body, his sinless flesh, may we do so with gratitude in our hearts. May we do so, Father, with a desire to partake in that perfect love. And may we do so with a the, with the desire to help others to understand the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Just as the bread represents the physical side of Jesus, his body, his flesh. The fruit of the vine represents the spiritual side, his blood. In Leviticus chapter 17 and 11, God tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Our bodies live as long as our blood is flowing through our veins. Blood is the connection between the physical and the spiritual. Man is not just flesh and bone. He is a spirit, a soul, in possession of a body. And Jesus was both. He gave himself, body and soul, to be that sacrifice. It was only through his complete submission to the Father's will that he was able to endure the suffering and that he was able to be our sacrifice. Jesus shed his blood when he was scourged. He shed his blood when his hands and feet were pierced on the cross. And he shed his blood also the night before when he went to the Father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke 22, beginning in verse 41, says... And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. I wonder sometimes whether Jesus would have been able to endure if this angel had not come to him, his concern, his fear was so great that God had to send an angel to minister to him. Verse 44 says, In being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Those great drops of blood were for us. Because he knew each one of us. He knew what we would do. He knew the sins that we would commit. And his desire was that we could be clean. That we could be washed pure. That our souls could be spotless. And it was only through the shedding of his blood that he could accomplish that. Back to John chapter 19. Jesus never broke a bone in his body. After everything that he had been through, all that he suffered, it was according to prophecy. 
that no bone of his would ever be broken. John 19, beginning in verse 32, says, Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. They were already nailed to the cross, but they had not died yet, and so the soldiers broke their legs because they could not be there hanging on the cross through the Sabbath. They wanted to speed up the death. They needed their legs to lift themselves up on the cross so that they could catch their breath, so that they could breathe. Having broken their legs, they could no longer rise up to breathe. The other soldier, the other, the others who were crucified suffered that pain as well. But when they came to Jesus, verse 33, and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. His chest cavity had filled up with water. That's how he died. That's how crucifixion takes life. When they pierced his side, the two elements came out, blood and water, the physical and the spiritual. Our salvation The blood of Jesus which washes us from our sins and the water in which we're baptized to represent His blood. It was only through the shedding of this blood that our sins can be washed away. We're going to sing now, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. And then we will partake of the fruit of the vine.
for Jesus' blood. That He was willing to go to the cross to bear our sins, to give His life so that we can be Your people, Your children, Your sheep. May we, Father, remember His sacrifice and cling to His precious blood as we partake of this fruit of the vine which represents the sacrifice that He made for us. In His name we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper consists of those two emblems, the unleavened bread representing Jesus' sinless body, the fruit of the vine representing His willing sacrifice of His blood. We have an example in the New Testament that shows us that the first century church was observing this memorial every first day of the week. They wouldn't miss an opportunity. It was a moment of fellowship. It was a moment that they were able to join in together in their appreciation for the one who had given all for them. And that's why we partake every first day of the week. Because it is the most important event in all of human history. It's why we come together. It's why we call each other brother and sister. It's because Jesus gave his life for us. In Acts chapter 20, we find this example that they were partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Verses 6 and 7, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days. Apparently they arrived in Troas on the first day of the week, but not in time to partake of this memorial together with the brethren there in that city. And so they abode there seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. He was ready to depart. He was continuing on his journey. But they tarried, they lingered for a week, so that they could partake of this memorial upon the first day of the week with their brethren. And that's our example for partaking of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. We also are instructed upon the first day of the week to give. It's not part of the Lord's Supper, but it is an act of worship. And our giving represents our thankfulness. Because of what we've examined, because of what we've considered that Jesus gave for us, let us use that thought to give back to God with cheerful hearts, with abundance, because He's blessed us, because He's given us everything that we need. Let us then give with that heart. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. There is a, a box in the foyer where you can place your contribution. You can give it to one of the elders. But it is part of our worship. So let's give God thanks for all His blessings to us. Our Father in Heaven, we're thankful for all the things You've given us. For the blessings of this life, both physical and spiritual. As we worship today, Father, may our hearts be full of gratitude. May we remember our dependence and our need for You. And may we give, Father, as we have prospered. We thank you for all these blessings in Jesus' name. As we think about the way that God has blessed us, we're going to sing, Oft We Come Together. Oft we come together, oft we sing and pray.
I may have miscalculated how long this would take for us to work through all this. So uh, when we do this again for the other acts of worship, I'll try to try to do a better job of keeping it in our accustomed time. But we have to extend the Lord's invitation. We have to preach God's word. That's part of worship as well. And I want us to consider that partaking of the Lord's Supper is an act of communion. That's what we often call it. Communion. And communion is a time when we are together. It's a time when our, we are joined together in spirit, in mind. We are of one accord. Communion is a time of unity. But we cannot have communion with God. We cannot have communion with Jesus Christ. We cannot have communion with each other until we have been added to His church. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In dying upon the cross, Jesus established His kingdom. He built His church. He purchased it with His blood. It is His eternal kingdom. It is spiritual. It's not this building. It's not a place. It is our hearts. Jesus bought our hearts with His blood. We then have communion with each other and with the Father. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are partaking of it new with Him in His kingdom. We remember that. And we long for that communion, that community, that fellowship with one another. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost when Jesus' resurrection was preached, when the gospel was preached for the first time. The people responded. 3,000 said, what shall we do? And they repented of their sins and were baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of those sins. And from that point forward, they were part of that communion. Acts 2 verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and in prayers. They were worshiping. They were part of that kingdom. They were Christians now. And they had communion with each other and with God. This morning, if you're here and you know that you're not in communion with God, you know that you don't have that relationship with Him that Jesus died to establish for you and with you, if you know that your sins have not been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, then you have that opportunity this morning. We extend to you the Lord's invitation to come unto Him, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and He will give you rest, to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord this morning. If you want communion with the Father, If you want communion with Jesus Christ, and if you want communion with your brothers and sisters, you must obey the gospel. We extend to you that invitation this morning if you've done that. But you recognize your observance of the Lord's Supper today and recently has been without communion. It has been without that relationship because there's sin in your life, because there's something that you've done or said, or because there's something you failed to do. Or say, and it's separating you from God. You no longer have that communion. If you'll repent, if you'll for, confess those things, you can be forgiven. We'll pray together. We encourage you, if you have need, to respond by coming forward this morning as we stand and sing this song. When we Thank you. 